Hi, my name's Leo and I'm a boat builder and a sailor. A few years ago, I bought a very old and quite famous wooden sailing yacht for the price of $1. And since then, I've been rebuilding that boat from the keel up with the help of a lot of amazing people. Now in this video, we're gonna be looking in depth at the progress on the boat's systems, in particular, the electrical system and the risks involved with that, including the possibility of electrocution, but also the uh, plumbing systems and the propulsion systems and various other things as well. Go there. So yeah, now George and I can do the lifting. If you guys do the guiding, it's pretty easy lift down here. Uh, that yeah. feels right to me. Uh, yeah. Nice. Yep. Guys, this camera is really heavy too, just so you know. <laughs> yeah, that's the big one. That's the 230 volt 50 hertz. Yeah. Whopper volts. 10,000 <laughs> volt amps. So we're here in Tally Ho's engine room and I'm with Joe Smith, who is Ocean Systems and is leading the systems in store for us. And um, we've got the main engine here, of course, but just above that, we just uh, installed the second inverter. It's not wired up yet, but we just placed it in the boat. So the inverters are kind of dual purpose. They will charge your batteries if you're attached to shore power to our electrical grid. And if you're disconnected, they will provide uh, AC power just like in your home to the boat. We have dual voltages on this boat. We have 120 volt uh, 60 hertz AC which is the standard in North America and then we have 230 volt 50 hertz AC which is the standard in Europe. Now I'm just going to give a really brief description of AC versus DC uh, for anyone who's not familiar just so we're all on the same page. Now AC or alternating current is uh, what most people have in their homes. It's usually higher voltages, typically 230 volts in Europe and 120 volts in North America. With higher AC voltages, that means the currents are lower, uh, which means there's less resistance and you can use smaller wires to power your energy intensive appliances. DC or direct current is usually found in batteries or on smaller electrical systems. And DC systems usually have lower voltages, so they're often six volts, 12 volts, 24. That means you have to use a much thicker wire, especially if you're going over a long distance. Uh, but they're generally much safer in terms of electrocution. And that's why it's hard to electrocute yourself on your car battery. In a boat, the stored energy is usually in DC batteries, uh, but some boats have appliances that have to run on AC, and that's where the inverse comes into play uh, because it turns that DC low voltage energy into high voltage AC energy. Also, if you're charging those batteries by plugging them in to the electrical grid on the shore, that conversion needs to happen the other way because the shore power is AC and it needs to be turned up to DC to charge the batteries. The basic rule of thumb is that the low voltages can catch fires. They're usually high current, low voltage, and then the high voltage systems can electrocute you. So there's a, a bunch of very important installation practices that involve how you tie, tie your grounds and neutrals together, mm -hmm. when you're allowed to have them tied together and when not. Uh, modern inverters take care of most of that, but we still have to understand those issues. It's very, very important. That's probably the most important. Um, there are devices that we're using now that actually don't protect you very well against electrocution, but help protect the boat against fires. And those are ELCIs or RCBOs that we put in the, in the shore power system. Mm -hmm. And we can protect personnel downstream or people on the boat uh, using GFCIs too, just like at your home. And that is the other big one. I mean, the fact that we're immersed in salt water when the boat's in the water, you can always be wet. So that, yeah. that is a, that's a risk. Now I need to make it clear that I am not an electrician and that even if I were, this video is not designed to show all the dangers of marine electrical installation or how to prevent them. It's extremely important that a marine electrical system is inspected and certified uh, by someone qualified and experienced. A marine electrical system that is not properly grounded, properly isolated, or uses the wrong gauge wires, or isn't crimped well, or a million other things, uh, can result in really serious injuries, accidents, and death. So don't just wing it. So we're gonna get back to the electrical system really soon. There's a lot more to talk about there, but for now we're gonna take a quick look at the exhaust system and Nick is actually gonna be drilling the hole through the transom for the exhaust outlet, uh, which is uh, one of the more nerve wracking jobs, I think, because uh, the transom, as you guys know, is one of the only remaining original parts of the boat and uh, it's a big old hole to be drilling through a big thick piece of 100 and something year old teak.
Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Nick, wait, wait. What are you doing? Filling a hole for the exhaust. Oh, my God. For the transom. Are you sure that's where it goes? No, no I'm not. <laughs> I think it might be where it goes. Don't do I'm that like to me, Patrick. 80, I'm 90% sure this is right. <laughs> Dude, look at that piece of teak. Dude, look how perfect that is. I left my chisel in here, so... <laughs> no way. Wait, do that again. Do that again. What? Uh, you want me to do a joke again? Yeah. <laughs> Very on. unnatural. I do that all the time. I can't. I can't do it. Nick left his chisel in the, <laughs> no, the lazarus. <laughs> What do you think, dude? How was that job? Dude, that was so, I am legit sweating. That is so stressful. Yeah? But it looks good. But I mean, how, how are you physically? Are you, are you tired? Are you about to do a joke that I don't understand? I mean, are you like... Exhausted? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm down in the lazarette and there's not a lot of room in here, uh, but this is the uh, exhaust through hole fitting that Nick installed into the transom. And there's still one piece of hose to put on here between this 180 degree elbow and the fitting, but we're gonna put that in as we actually bed the fitting in for good. Right now it's just dry fitted. Apart from that though, the exhaust system is pretty much finished. It comes out of the engine, uh, there's a muffler, and then it comes through this bulkhead up this uh, hose here, through the elbow and out through the transom. The purpose of this elbow is to prevent seawater from uh, coming in and backfilling the system. Uh, that could only happen if the engine was off, but if there was a lot of breaking waves uh, and we didn't have this two and a half foot rise here, water could get in, fill up the muffler, and then get into the engine itself, which would be bad news. Now, as most of you probably know, this entire project is paid for by these YouTube videos. And most of that is through the amazing generosity of you guys, for which I am so grateful. Now recently, all my costs have been going up a lot, so I've also been doing a few integrated ads, and this video is sponsored by Foreo, which is a Swedish wellness tech company. Hey Nick, you doing all right, man? No, it's Pat and Clifton's birthday soon, and I want to get them something nice, but those guys have everything. They don't have youthful glowing skin. You're right, you should get them one of these. So this thing is called The Bear by Foreo Sweden and it's a microcurrent device that can give you or your partner a mini facelift from home. <laughs> it works by using pulsations and microcurrents to tighten and firm the skin for a youthful contoured complexion. And this is happy birthday you two. Oh, why thank you. What are these? They're for your face. Oh dang. I don't know about that. Might as well give it a shot. Foreo products have won more than 120 design and beauty awards in the past three years, so they're a highly respected brand. The Bear is clinically proven to significantly improve skin firmness in just one week. Well, that's the story of when I pumped the Queen's bilges. <laughs> Holy sh! you guys look amazing. Thanks, Erica. I've been using this here device and I feel like it's taken years off my face. I even used it on the old companionway hatch and look at it now. <laughs> so as you can see, the bear would make a great gift for yourself or your significant other. Uh, and although we can't guarantee results when used on a wooden boat, 98% of users report that their skin looks healthier and brighter within just one week of using it. So big thanks to Foreo for sponsoring this video. What's going on in here, Joe? Well, I am installing this vented loop for the wet exhaust. Uh -huh. It's uh, the wet exhaust is right at the water line. It almost doesn't need a vented loop actually, but we're gonna put one in and what it does is it keeps water 
that uh, might create a siphon through the sea chest into the exhaust and then build up in the exhaust and flood the engine, it breaks the siphon right here and uh, prevents that from happening. Nice. Yeah. That sounds smart. It's a good thing to have. <laughs> Yeah, I put the motor controllers in under the bunk, which felt like a, a good accomplishment. Uh, with wiring, it was kind of tricky. I had to do it with a service loop so that the controllers could be on the bunk because I couldn't physically wire it standing on my head in there. And so then I slid it into place and put it in and all the wires looked pretty good. Yeah, it's looking great. I decided to do the siphon loop because it was Friday. I was like, I can get one thing done. I don't have to think about it a lot. Get it installed. Yeah. Move forwards. That's not doing anything with high voltage after three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Exactly. Right? <laughs> I like that. Does that look good to you, Leo? Yeah. That's nice. Double hose clamps are great. Most hose barbs are not sized to accommodate two hose clamps. So if you can't get two hose clamps on appropriate properly, I'd rather do one really good quality hose clamp put in the right spot. Um, the only place that ABYC requires double hose clamps are on wet exhaust. And you'll see we have double hose clamps here. And on fuel fills, and fuel vents. You would like to have one hose clamp's width of space. You don't want your hose clamp right on the bitter end of your hose. Mm -hmm. And you don't want it overhanging the barb. So these, these barbs, you could almost get legitimately two hose clamps on them. Um, these are absolutely top-notch hose clamps. They're AWOBs and they're uh, made out of 316 stainless and have the embossed band rather than the band that has the perforations going all the way through so they last a really long time <laughs> i've never seen one come off so <laughs> yeah you know yeah. i have seen the older style of cheaper hose clamps corrode all the way through and break yeah but uh not these ones okay so this locker is sort of the heart of the electrical system on the boat uh, the main 48 volt distribution locker and uh, the location of all our batteries. And I'm going to try and explain our electrical distribution system uh, with some diagrams, starting with where the electricity comes into the boat when we're plugged into shore power, uh, which would be coming through the lazarette, uh, through some shore power cables, and then through some ELCIs, which are safety mechanisms, and through some form of galvanic isolation for the ground wires before the electricity gets to the inverters, which are on the other side of this bulkhead. There'll be two shore power inlets, a 110 volt and a 230 volt, and there are two inverters, one for each voltage. And they'll never be simultaneously plugged into shore power, it'll be one or the other. Now, if one of the inverters is plugged into shore power, that is converting that AC shore power voltage, the alternating current, into DC, direct current, 48 volts. And that 48 volt supply is coming through this bulkhead and through one of these switches. There's one of these for each inverter. All of these switches are remote switches, which means that uh, they can be mechanically switched right here, but they can be much more easily switched via a 12 volt relay uh, at the nav station. The 48 volt supply from one of the inverters when plugged into shore power will be coming up through this wire to power the 48 volt bus bar, which is inside these Victron units. Uh, and that will be then charging our batteries, which are also 48 volt through these four pairs of cables. There's actually eight 24 volt batteries, but they're wired together in pairs in series to form four 48 volt batteries. Now when the boat's at sea or at anchor, uh, the shore power of course will not be connected and the batteries will usually be supplying power to this bus bar. With that power, the bus bar will be supplying the two hybrid controllers through these two cables and these two switches. And I know from that angle it looks like these contacts are really close, but actually they're not at all. There's a really good distance in between. It's just the angle. So these two switches supply power to the hybrid controllers, which then supply power to the hybrid motors for propulsion under electric power. Now, when the engine is in generator mode, uh, the power will be going the other way through these switches and actually supplying the bus bar, and that will be charging 
the batteries. We've got one more outlet from this main 48 volt bus bar and that is uh, these cables which go through a service loop to these kind of secondary 48 volt bus bars. And I should note that all these bus bars have fuses uh, on their positive contacts. So this 48 volt bus bar supplies a couple of different things. It supplies the uh, windlass, uh, which is gonna have a 48 volt motor through this large cable, which actually goes down to another remote switch before going to the windlass. And it also supplies through these two smaller cables, these two Orion 48 to 12 volt converters. So the only real items on the boat which actually run directly off 48 volt will be the hybrid motors uh, and the anchor windlass. All the other DC house loads will be 12 volts and they'll all be supplied through these two converters which supply a positive and negative 12 volt bus bar on the side of the locker. I should note that all these yellow wires are DC negative wires uh, and so these are connected back to this bus bar for example and this is just the negative bus bar for this part of the 48 volt system. This yellow cable uh, is a joint negative for the two inverters and goes through the bulkhead here onto the other side. Now this 12 volt bus bar on the side of the locker is also connected to our 12 volt house battery and that's a sort of a buffer battery if you like an accumulator almost uh, because all the house loads are going to be constantly supplied by these two converters so it's constantly drawing from the main 48 volt bank but if there's a spike in power which these two converters can't keep up with uh, or if for some reason this fails, the 12 volt house battery will be acting as a buffer to give that extra bit of power needed. Next to our 12 volt house battery at the bottom of this locker, we've got our 12 volt engine starting battery. That is wired, of course, to the starter motor on the engine and also to the alternator. So it will be mainly charged by the engine alternator at 12 volts DC, but it's also connected to this Orion 12 volt to 12 volt DC charger. And what that will do is if the engine battery is above a sufficient voltage, it will charge the 12 volt house battery from the engine battery. And what that means is that if there's a problem with our 48 volt to 12 volt converters or our whole 48 volt system or batteries, uh, we can actually run our 12 volt DC house systems uh, from the alternator on the engine through the engine start battery and this charger unit. So that does add quite a lot of redundancy, although in that case, we wouldn't be able to run a lot of big loads, but we would be able to have some nav lights and some basic navigational equipment. On the other hand, if there's a problem with the other part of the system, the alternator or the 12 volt engine start battery, the two 12 volt batteries are wired together through an on off both switch, which is in the engine room. And so if the engine battery is flat, that switch can be changed to both and it'll be able to start the engine from the house battery. Eventually this 12 volt bus will be supplying all the DC house loads in the boat. It'll be wired through a switch and a fuse or a breaker to the electrical switching panel, which will be in the nav area. And that's pretty much the DC side of the electrical distribution system. We haven't talked much about the AC side, but basically uh, that'll be wired directly from the inverters through the necessary uh, switches and fuses into the uh, AC supply and switching panels, which will be near the nav station as well. Now we do have ventilation in this locker. We have these three quite powerful fans at the top of the locker, which are gonna be pulling hot air out uh, and they'll be on a thermostat as well as uh, having a manual switch. Uh, we've got holes in the bottom of the locker, which will allow cold air to come in from the bilge. Um, so there'll be circulation through here, although the front of the locker will be totally air and watertight sealed. All of the Victron equipment, including the batteries, do monitor their temperature and they do automatically shut down uh, or limit their output if they go over temperature. In terms of fire suppression, there will be fire ports uh, probably on the sides of this locker and specialized dedicated fire extinguishers that can be engaged through those ports. It is worth noting though that these batteries are lithium iron phosphate, uh, which is actually a very different chemistry from lithium ion. Uh, which uh, can be quite unstable, but these are extremely stable and extremely safe. Fire risk of using these batteries on board is very, very low. Oh shit, not there. <coughs> How's this boat supposed to float with all these oh holes God. in it? Good lord. Did he call you and tell you to videotape me? Actually, yeah. He just called me. He just called me and said, Hey, I just saw Erica's drilling a hole in the boat. Grab a camera, man. Wow. And I was like, 
I was like, okay. Oh my god. <laughs> You know how hard we worked on that paint job? <laughs> well, you want to tell the camera what you just did? I'm drilling a hole for the vent in the vented loop coming from the black water tank. Nice. And that will allow the black water tank to fill up with? Poop. <laughs> <laughs> Poop. Poopy. Nice. Yeah. So as well as electrical work, there's also been a lot of plumbing work going on. And right now we're gonna look at the black water system. That's the wastewater from the head. And one of the most important parts of that system is the holding tank, uh, where that waste is stored until you can safely and legally pump it overboard when you're offshore or get it pumped out through a deck fitting at the dock. Now holding tanks can be a bit difficult because uh, they usually contain a lot of seawater, uh, which is flushed through the head, uh, as well as all the organic waste and it, all that stuff can be very corrosive. So uh, metal tanks uh, often don't last that long. And you can get some pretty good pre-made uh, fiberglass or plastic tanks, but uh, in this case, I wanted the tank to be a very specific shape and size so it could fit uh, behind some lockers uh, next to the head. Now, although I did have a really bad experience with welded plastic diesel tanks, I decided to give the material another shot because uh, if done well, it really is the best material for a wastewater holding tank like this. Found a local guy who trades as Northwest Plastics and he's been making a really beautiful custom shape plastic wastewater holding tank. The plastic material he's using is half an inch thick so it's much thicker, much stronger than what the diesel tanks were made of uh, and you can see that the construction is very different. The welds are all filleted, they all go all the way through. Uh, it's really beautifully made and it's gonna be really strong. The tank is nearly finished and when it is, we'll get it installed and then the black water system will be nearly complete. So what, and what the hell is going on here? Because it's really confusing <laughs> look, let's just is, to look at. Let's... We're trying to dry fit the black water tank. This is what precision looks Which is like. where the poo poo goes. Nice bro. Oh. Me, but it's not resting. Hey, mind your f***ing... Sorry, I keep forgetting the camera's out. You said mind your <laughs> Um, okay. Hey. He's hey. feeling strong this morning. Oh, no. Christ. We just did a bunch of strong stuff. <laughs> One per day. Yeah, I hear that. Can I get a hand out? Uh, you give us a few. George looks pretty busy. Mm -hmm. We can do it tomorrow. Well, if someone has to supervise these two, they'll just be cracking jokes all day. Okay. <laughs> oh, never mind, never mind. Zeal's here. I know he's feeling <sighs> Thank God. All right. Can we... How do we lift this? I can pry it up. Nick, can you just explain what's going on here real quick? Yeah. And I'll leave you alone. Um, yeah, so we are trying to put in supports for the black water tank. Uh, and we're doing a dry fit right now to make sure the supports work. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean, Leo? While being harassed at work. Ah. <laughs> I just want to work in a safe place. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Can you help me? Jesus. Yeah, dude, okay. We're, we're dry fitting the black water tank. Yeah. How many times do I have to tell you? I you think do? it's pretty obvious <laughs> what we're doing. Okay, so Erica, your plumbing work in the head is looking great. Can you tell us roughly what's been going on? Yeah, um, I've been uh, dry mounting everything so it can get taken apart again to get the uh, walls painted. And I've installed the pump for the head and a few Y valves and these very important vented loops. Great. Why are they so important? Well, they prevent the boat from sinking. <laughs> that is important. Yeah. So I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on how this system actually works, uh, starting with the vented loops. The reason that they're so important is that without them, the whole black water system could actually create a siphon pulling in seawater from our underwater through hull through the actual head. And if that went unchecked, it could actually fill the boat up with water. But with a vented loop, we have a high point in the system, which is well above the waterline, and this vent that goes through one of the through holes that Erica installed, which lets air in to break the vacuum to break the siphon. So this system contains just one hand pump and two Y valves, uh, but they're orientated in such a way that you can use that one pump to flush the toilet directly overboard, to flush the toilet into the tank, or to empty the tank overboard. 
So from the toilet itself, the head unit, uh, which is supplied by raw water, that's seawater, from there, when it's flushed, uh, the waste travels to the first Y valve, which is underneath the cabinetry, the other side of that bulkhead. And from there, it goes to the hand pump. From the hand pump, it comes up this pipe to the second Y valve, uh, where it can be directed either directly overboard through this vented loop, or through this pipe, through the bulkhead and into the top of the waste water holding tank. To empty the tank overboard, the bottom Y valve is just turned so that the pump is pulling from the bottom of the tank instead of from the toilet itself. And then this Y valve is turned so that it is directing the flow overboard. The beauty of this system is that it's very simple um, and has very few moving parts and there's only one pump which is manually operated and it's extremely easy to service. The toilet itself works by creating a vacuum seal with the lid so that as you use the pump to pull the waste out of it, it simultaneously pulls uh, raw water into the toilet bowl. We were talking about vented loops earlier and there's another vented loop for the raw water supply side for the head and that's mounted right here on this bulkhead for exactly the same reason to prevent a siphon um, from forming and filling up the boat through the toilet. All in all I'm really pleased with the system. All this stuff will be hidden behind the cabinetry except for the pump and this one hose on the bulkhead but I really don't mind seeing some exposed plumbing uh, if it's done well and the alternative is to build out a lot more cabinetry which would take up a lot more space. We got a lot of threads, huh? Fun, huh? And then we get to take it out and then do it all over again. Time of my life, baby. All right, she got the tank. All right, hold on. Let me take a look, see? So you just saw some more through hole fittings getting installed by Paddy and Nick. Uh, those through holes are for the raw water inlets, for the main engine cooling and for the water maker. Uh, they both have seacocks, valves um, and will supply those systems with salt water. It's a good idea to put inlets on the opposite side of the boat to the black water discharge if possible, uh, just in case uh, the inlets happen to be sucking at the same time as the black water tank is being emptied. And seeing as the theme of this video it seems to be electrocution and poop, uh, we actually received some fake dog poo in the mail recently from a fan, or perhaps not a fan, I'm not quite sure what they were trying to say. This is Patty's bench, right? And we have this fake dog poop. We'll see if we can get him. Oh! <laughs> you guys see my little gift? Huh? What? That I almost stepped in. Wait a minute. What the f is this? <laughs> what the f Who did that? Is that you? <laughs> is there a camera on me? You got me. We got you. Now we were talking about the hybrid system earlier and one feature of that system is that the engine can be used as a standalone generator. But for that to happen, the shaft has to be disengaged from the gearbox because the gearbox itself uh, has to be in gear for the generators to turn. To engage and disengage the shaft, there's a device called a shaft clutch, which is attached to the gearbox and the prop shaft. Um, and it's a series of kind of dogs which go in and out uh, to turn one another. And to control that engagement, there's a bracket that moves, uh, there's a cable and there's a Morse control. Now to re-engage the shaft clutch after the engine has been used as a generator, it's very likely that the dogs won't be lined up and so they won't be able to engage. Now there's actually an electrical button on the Morse control itself, which will slowly turn the engine around using the electric motors until those dogs are in the correct position and then you can move the Morse control to engage them. Now that's not an operation which is gonna to have to happen all the time, but it does have to be easy to do and Joe has been working on the ins and outs of mounting all those units. Let's see, how did I do this last time? I was... Are you asking about it? 
kind of a pain. Clutch, engage. <laughs> You're pleased with yourself, Jerry? Yes. What, what? I modified the bracket to make it work. Some boat builder forgot that we had to put a clutch on here. <laughs> so. <laughs> Patrick, come check out my clutch. Sure, Joe. <laughs> Look at this. Wow. Yeah, it's cool, huh? Jesus. I had to modify it quite a bit to get it to work because they put the engine beds in the way. So I had to flip it over, cut off the bottom edge there. I made some new bushings for the bearing point and changed the fixed point on the push pull cable. Why don't you go ahead and try Just that out, Patrick? Oh, me? Go really? Ahead. Give it a whirl. Gee. Engage. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and you can't turn the electric motors slash generators with the engine unless the engine transmission's in gear, which would spin the prop also. That would spin the prop, yeah. So what we'd like to do is disengage the prop. Now the engine can spin without sprinting, spinning the prop. So now this is a giant diesel generator. Genset, yeah, it's a genset. And uh, Joe, can you just tell us about the why you chose to put that that uh why chose how blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> well use your words Leo, <laughs> i chose to put the lever there because you're done charging and it's the morning and you want to use your engine to drive off the anchor because there's the a high, high likelihood that the engine will stop in a position that doesn't allow you to engage the clutch so with this button here you can slowly roll the engine over using the electric motors until you can feel and then also see that you have real positive engagement and boom so it'd be nice to be able to visually see that action what this is all a cooling system for the hybrid motors they have uh, what we call a closed circuit cooling system which means that they have ethylene glycol in them and then we use this little cute little heat exchanger that runs seawater through tubes that run parallel or actually they run opposite directions with the glycol to transfer the heat from the hybrid motors into the sea ocean how do you how do you resist the urge to just do this over and over all day yeah i'm not like it doesn't it's not hard <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's one answer. Yeah. This is the tortilla warmer, right? Mm -hmm. It's chock full of corn tortillas right there, I think. Right? That's a generously sized air filter. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> right on top of the block is probably where you warm your tortillas. Yeah, that'd be a good spot. I've cooked a lasagna on, on top of the engine block. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not because it was fun either. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them the time that you, you cooked the uh, Gorilla Glue on the... Uh... Oh, no, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try that. I want to go. Oh, yeah. Smooth, right? Yeah, it's a nice click. Well, I hope this video hasn't been too technical. It's always hard to know what level of detail to go into. Of course, the more detail, uh, the longer it takes and the less people the video appeals to. Uh, but I don't wanna just gloss over these things either. So anyway, I hope it's been enjoyable and some of it at least has been understandable. I'm sure for some people, uh, this sort of video is great and for others, it's probably not, but that's okay. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching and a massive, massive thank you to everyone who has donated or otherwise supported this project. It does make a huge difference. It means we're able to keep on doing this work and it means I'm able to make and edit these videos. So I really, really appreciate it. And I'll see you next time. Cheers. Something that they don't have is youthful glowing skin. <laughs> 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 I wanted to help. <laughs> First thing that you think of. <laughs>